Hi, this is Precalculus section 1.4. We're going to deal with functions and then some of the domain items with functions. Now you have a note sheet that you should be filling out and I'm going to go through a PowerPoint and maybe show some examples that are on this note sheet too. But when you're done, this should be all filled out and we'll check that in class as, as well. Okay, so follow along with the PowerPoint and then take notes as you need to pause along the way when you have to. So this first chapter, a lot of it's about relations and functions, and so I'm going to maybe review a little bit of stuff that you've done before, so if you didn't have a good foundation for that, you can get some information for, about that. Okay, so relations involves two or more quantities that are related to one another by some rule. And for example, temperature is related to time of day, number of house sales is related to the time of the year, air pressure is related to altitude, infinite number of ways that we can represent two uh, variables or unknowns together. Now, uh, a, re a relation signs an output value for every input value. So if you look here on the left-hand side, we have the input values, and over here we have the output values. And each one of the inputs is matched up with each one of the outputs over here. Okay? And then the values of the input are called domain, and then the output values are called the range. Now, if we take a function, a function is a special type of relation where just one output value for each input value are related in that way. So here I have 1, 1, 1. Each one of these maps to a certain value. Now, the 0 doesn't map to two values. It only maps to 1. So even though that both of these values go to the 6, that's still OK. Because 2 goes to 6, 0 goes to 6. But each one of these values of the domain only go to 1 that are in the relation or in the, I'm sorry, the range. And is this a function? Yes. Now if we look at this, now we have problems here at the zero. Zero maps to two different values, and when that happens, that's not a function anymore. So the domain items have to be unique, okay? So there's our problem, no. And then four ways to represent a function numerically. You might have to take and pause this to copy this, some of this down. But numerically, we would do a table of values. And mathematically, we want to look at all the different ways that we can do this. So we have an input, which is our x, and our output, which is our y. So which one's the domain? Well, I hope you said the x's. So 2, 3, 4 would be the domain. And then the range would be 11, 10, 8, and 1, those specific discrete values. Graphically, that's another way to represent things. What's the domain here? Well, if you look at the domain, I have my x value is 0. I got a half. I got a 1. I got a 1.5. And, and I got a 2. So write those down. And then your range would be your y value. So I got a 10. I got a 9. I got a 7. I got a 4. And I got a 0. So you can write those in set notations. OK, another way to represent uh, mathematically is with the uh, algebraic expression. So y equals x squared minus 3x plus 2. Now if we find the domain and range for this, this is, gets a little bit trickier because, well, for the domain, it's easy. It should be all reals. So write that down, all reals. The range, however, since this is a parabola, it goes wherever we go down to for the range. So if I put this equation in, there's my minimum there. And so I can do it one way. I can do it algebraically too, but I want to find the minimum here, number 3. So I'm going to pick a point on the left, which is 1. Another one that's on the right, which is 3. And somewhere in between for a guess. And there we get it. Ne uh, 1.5, negative 0.25. Which one would be the minimum? Well, it's negative 0.25. So when I talk about my range, it's going to be x is greater than negative 0.25. So that's what you would put for that. So the domain is all reals, and the range should be, I said x, but it should be y. y is greater than negative 0.25. And you can put that in set notation if you're familiar with that. And then verbally, using a sentence is another way to represent mathematical items. And so we do this one. Volume of a cube. How do you find the volume of a cube? Well, volume is equal to s cubed. So what's my domain? What can I plug in for s? All reals. Oh, I don't think so, because this is geometry, so things are usually positive. So this would be, domain would be s greater than 0. If it's equal to 0, you don't have a cube. And then your range would be greater than 0, too. Y values would be greater than 0. Okay, which one of these would form a function? 
Look at this, make an answer. Yes or no? Well, I think yes. Do the X's match up? No, they do not. And so each X is paired with uh, individual Y there. Okay, so the, the X's don't double up. If I look at this one, is this a function? Pause if you have to. And I hope you would say that this one would be no, because the X's do double up. Actually, they quadruple up. So this is not a function because the X value in the domain maps to more than one value in the Y's or the range. Is this C a function? Well, if you look at this, yes or no? Oh, there's the twos. Okay, so that's not going to be a function. So that's how you can kind of determine that. Graphically, if we take these points and plot them, we'd have certain values. If I plugged all these or plotted all these points, these points would be stacked on top of another. So graphically, we do something that's called the vertical line test to see if things are a function. So if we graph this one here, here my x's double up at 0. So graphically, I get this situation here. So we do what we call the vertical line test. And this is not a function because the vertical line passes through those two points. And if that happens anywhere for your curve, then it is not a function. Okay, algebraic test for a function. If I see something like this, what I can do is solve for y and see what kind of solving, what the solving does and make sure that for any x value that I plug in, I only get out one y. So if I do that, I solve for y, and I'm going to get y equals x squared minus 7. And any x that I plug in there, I am only going to get out one y. So yes, this is a function. Take notes and pause if you have to. And we also say that this is y in terms of x. That means we solve for y, and everything over here is x or numbers. No other things. Okay, this one. How about if we solve this one for y? And when we do this, if we take the square root, so I take the square root of y squared, and I'm going to get plus and minus on the other side. When that happens, that means that for any x value that I'm plugging in here that works for this domain, any x value that I plug in here, I'm going to get out a plus and minus situation, which means I'm going to get out two y's. And so therefore, this is not a function. Whenever you have that plus and minus, it's not going to be a function. And then now fu function notation. f of x is equal to x squared minus 7. We read this as f of x. It's not f times x. It's f of x. You should be familiar with this, though. Consider this function. If I want to find f of negative 1, what I do is wherever I see x, I replace it with a negative 1. So if I plug this in here, I'm going to get negative 6. So f of negative 1 is equal to negative 6. And so this point is on the graph of the function of f. So let's go through some examples here. Why don't you pause this and try to do a, b, and c, and then we'll try to do d together. And I'll show you some answers that we have here. So here are the first two answers. And so if you do f of 2, you just take out x. And wherever you see x, you replace it with a 2. And this was 6 times 2, and it gives me 12, so you get 21. Wherever you saw x here, you replace with an n, so it's pretty much the same thing, except for n instead. Now here, where I have x minus 1, wherever I see the x, i got to replace it with x minus 1. Now, I don't know if you think that we should leave it like that or not, but in this case, no. So we're going to simplify. So it's x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus 6x minus 6 plus 5. And then you can go ahead and simplify that. x squared, combine like terms, that would be give me 4x. And then 1, and that, oop, nothing. So this would be all that it is, because the constants drop out. OK, now this one, I said we'd do it together, because it gets a little bit trickier. We'll take this piece right here first. And so wherever I see x, I'm going to plug, plug in 2 plus h. So this is going to be equal to 2 plus h quantity squared plus, and I got to do the whole thing here because I'm taking it and putting it in for x. So it's x squared and then 6 times x, which is now 2 plus h. And then I got to go plus 5. All that stuff comes from there in the red. 
Now I got to continue on and do the rest of it. So I got minus f of 2. Well, if I do minus f of 2, I already did f of 2 here, but it's just taking 2 and plugging it in this function, and I'm going to get 21. Oh, I tried to change that color. It didn't work. And then I go, go all over my h. Now what I got to do is I got to go ahead and simplify this. I would recommend that you go simplify this. I'm going to pause this. You pause it too and go simplify it and come. If I expand this out, don't forget the middle term. So you get 4 plus 4h plus h squared. Then I do this one, 12 plus 6h, and then plus 5 minus the 21. If you notice, all of these constants end up dropping out. They cancel each other off. So you're just left with h squared plus 10h. 4 and 6 together make the 10. If I divide that by h, I like to do what I call the rabbit method. If you have a monomial in the bottom, you can see if it cancels with everything in the top. So if I take this, I can go like that. So h squared over h is just h, and then 10h over h is 10. So you just get h plus 10. I hope you guys got that one. This will show up on different assessments, so be careful with that. See the rabbit, by the way? OK, here we go. Uh, piecewise functions. Piecewise functions can be defined by at least two equations, each applied at different times. So if I take g of x, what happens here is that this tells me when this piece of the equation is going on. x is less than or equal to 1. Here, if x is greater than 1, I apply this function. So for instance, if I do g of 3, then I need to plug it in this one here. If I do g of negative 4, well, negative 4 is less than 1, so I plug it into this one here and evaluate it. So each piece is turned on depending upon the x value here. Okay, now another one is the absolute value function. You can write this as a piecewise function as well. So y equals absolute value of x can be written like this. x, if x is greater than 0, 0 if x is equal to 0. This is the funny one that stumps people. But if I have a negative 4, negative 4 is less than 0. Well, what's the absolute value of negative 4? It's positive 4. So this negative will affect the other negative, and they'll cancel each other out. So this will just give us a positive. Okay, so now try these values and see if you can get these to work. Pause this and then I'll go through and work these out too. Okay, and looking at this, g of 2, where does 2 fall? Is 2 less than 1 or greater than 1? Well, it's going to be greater than 1. So I'm going to apply this function at that time. So it's 3 times 2 plus 1. And then negative 2, where does that fall? Is it less than 1 or greater than 1? I should say less than or equal to. Well, here it is. It falls in this category, so I'm going to go 2 times negative 2 minus 1 is equal to negative 5. Okay? So it depends where the piece falls, and then you evaluate it by that. This will tell you. Okay, finding the zeros, this might show up in your homework. I'm not going to even go through these, though. But if you find the zeros, you set this function equal to 0. Solve for x. Set this function equal to 0, solve for x. You're going to have to factor and find the different pieces, but I trust that you can find that. Something else that you might see are simultaneous equations. That's where two equations both occur at the same time. So in other words, it's points of intersections on the graph. So all you do for this is that you'd set this function equal to this function, get it all equal to 0, and factor and solve. Make sure you're able to do that. Then if we do d domain, we got to work with this a little bit. The domain of a function, the implied domain, consists of all real numbers for which the expression is defined. Now, where we run into trouble a lot of times with these functions is when we divide by 0, and also when we take the square root of a negative. So we have to look at both of those cases. And on your sheet, I have a couple of examples for that. OK, on the sheet, I finished up those problems, too. Make sure that you're able to figure out which domains those are in. If not, ask questions, OK? So here we go. Implied domain. For this function right here, where is the problem? Well, division by 0 is our problem. So for this one, really, t cannot be 14. If I'm sorry, negative 14. If t is negative 14, then our denominator becomes 0. Doesn't matter what happens in the numerator, just the denominator. So if t is negative 14, we have a problem. We can't divide by 0. 
So when we talk about our domain, our domain is all reals except for t cannot be negative 14. For this one here, when we look at this square root, we cannot take the square root of a negative. So everything has to be positive. So in other words, 2x plus 1 has to be greater than 0. Could it be equal to 0? Can you take the square root of 0? Yes. So I use the equal sign when this is in the numerator. So if I solve this out, 2x is greater than or equal to 1. So x is greater than or equal to 1 half. So that would be my domain for this function here. Now if you look at this one, this one has the same item in the denominator. Well, what happens with this? Well, 2x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0 for the square root. But since it's in the denominator, I just do greater than 0 because I can't divide by 0. So this one turns out to be x is greater than, well, I, I missed the negative there, sorry. x is greater than negative 1 half. Okay? So the difference here is that this one has to be greater than or equal to 0 because I can take the square root of 0. This one I can take the square root of 0, but it's in the denominator. So I can't do the equal partial for this piece. Okay, why don't you go ahead and summarize some of the items that you've learned from this lesson and a lot of its review, but I think that this implied domain, there's also some uh, examples in the Stitz and Zegler book, section 1.4, they have even a few more examples of this domain thing that you might want to go ahead and read. I think that that is really good reading that you can go ahead and deal with. All right, thank you very much. Have a great day.